Hi everyone and welcome to Learner Radiology. I'm Brent Weinberg. Today's video is going to be a quick hitting video on five ways to improve your CTA aneurysm search. So how you can use five tangible tips to get better at finding aneurysms on CT of the head. This is a little bit longer version of a video I put together earlier with Everlight Radiology. It's got a few additional case examples and a little bit longer explanations. So let's dive in. Step number one have a standard search pattern. This is really important. You want to be doing the same thing every time. It's one of these things. If you do it hundreds, thousands of times, you're going to get better. So what is my search pattern? So generally speaking, I start anteriorly and then I move from right to left and then I move to posterior. So I start with the right anterior circulation, such as the internal carotid here. I'll follow it up. Then I'm going to move over to the left internal carotid, follow that up intracranially. Then I'm going to move posteriorly to the right vertebral artery, the right posterior circulation, and then I'm going to move to the left posterior circulation and left vertebral artery, and I'm going to go in that pattern every single time. Step number two to improving your CTA aneurysm search is to know the common aneurysm locations. If you know the common aneurysm locations, you could spend a little bit of extra time focusing on those spots, maybe minimize uh, your risk of missing an aneurysm in those common locations. So the most common location for an intracranial aneurysm is the anterior communicating artery. That makes up about 35% of intracranial aneurysms. You see this aneurysm here coming off the anterior communicating artery right there uh, off, of the, off the patient's right. The second most common location is the carotid terminus. That makes up about 30%. That includes all of the carotid terminus sublocations. Okay, so the ophthalmic the PCOM and the carotid terminus all lumped into that 30%. Okay, the third most common location, the MCA bifurcation. You can see this person has a second aneurysm here, the MCA bifurcation. That makes up about 20%. Okay, and then your final location is the posterior circulation. So basilar tip, proximal PCAs, a little bit further around the PCAs, maybe SCA origin. That's only around 10%. So here's just a summary of those common aneurysm locations. So remember anterior communicating, internal carotid, and MCA. So about 80 to 90% of aneurysms are in the anterior portion of the circulation with only about 10% in the posterior locations with the most common being a basilar tip aneurysm. So using some of the principles we've talked about, we're now going to take a look at a couple of example cases. Here we have a patient who's a relatively young patient, a male in his 30s, comes in with subarachnoid hemorrhage. These are some images from a head CT. You can see as you come up to the basal cisterns, there's a lot of blood, blood going into the cilia and fissures and the interhemispheric fissure here. So a lot of subarachnoid blood that you can see. Now these images are from the patient's CTA, which was taken shortly after the head CT. And we're just gonna start following up this ICA here, see if we can identify the source of the aneurysm. See the ICA here, you see the MCA, it looks okay. You follow the ACA, and if you look, there's an outpouching right here at the anterior communicating artery. It looks like it's arising maybe from the left origin of the anterior communicating artery. So this is an anterior communicating artery aneurysm, which is one of the most common locations. Step number three to improving your aneurysm search, use your reformats and 3D imaging. These are supplemental tools that can help you confirm when an aneurysm is there. You can also use them to search areas specifically to be a little bit more sensitive in those locations. So what do I mean about that? So you usually have a series of reformats. These consist of multiplanar reformats, which is just taking the thin slice data and displaying it in a different plane. So you should have these in generally all three planes or the ability to generate those in your packs. You also have MIPS, which are a special form of 3D reformat that shows a thicker slice with the highest intensity voxel in between. This can be great for seeing the continuity of vessels, maybe helping something stand out just a little bit. And your final supplemental tool is 3D volume renderings. A lot of times you'll have to access those through an external tool, but you may have that built into your packs. This is a nice way to make measurements of aneurysms or maybe just uh, hone in on what the abnormality is. Let's take another look at a case and see how 3D reformats can help us figure out where the aneurysm is. This patient didn't present with subarachnoid hemorrhage, but rather presented with an acute right third nerve palsy. These are some images from the head CT, but you'll find the head CT is pretty normal. We don't see any subarachnoid blood. Now we have some images from the patient's CT angiogram, and we're expecting an abnormality to be on the right, and we're gonna follow up this right internal carotid artery. 
as it comes around. It's sort of tortuous in the cavernous sinus here. But in the region of the carotid terminus, we see an outpouching here. You kind of see this multi-lobulated outpouching here, which is concerning. But it's a little bit challenging to see exactly where it's rising from. And so we'd like to see if we can use our 3D reformats to better localize that and figure out what exactly is going on. To do that now, we've pulled up some of our reformats here. You'll see on the right side of the screen, this is a coronal multiplanar reformat, which is just a thin slice image. And we're gonna scroll until we find that abnormality. And depending on how your studies are sent, as these may be sent by the technologist, or you may be able to generate them in packs. But what you see is you see the area where the abnormality is. We're gonna turn on the localizer there and drag that over there. We can actually see that outpouching is an inferiorly directed outpouching coming from the carotid artery that comes down there. And the coronal allows you to see that a little bit better. If we switch to a sagittal view, we're going to just get another view of this same abnormality. So here you see the carotid on this side, turning posteriorly right at the carotid terminus. And you have this downward directing outpouching arising from the carotid artery. It kind of has multi uh, lobules there. And you can see that's a bilobed aneurysm coming off of the carotid terminus. Again, a very common location for aneurysm. Now MIPS or maximum intensity projections are a special type of 3D reformat in which a thick slice is generated, but only the brightest pixel value is counted. Here you see the axial MIPS of the same case we were just looking at. And MIPS are gonna, you're gonna be able to recognize them because they have this flowing type uh, visualization of the vessels so you can see their continuity and uh, this is extremely helpful in this case uh, because what you're going to see here is here's our aneurysm and you can actually see the connectivity of the aneurysm and this bilobed aneurysm here a little bit better and you're going to often have these MIPS in all three planes. So what are the most important uses of the MIPS? I use them uh, a little bit in a, almost every case because they're great if you want to see the vessels out in a longitudinal plane. And here you see the axial MIPS do a very nice job of laying out the MCAs and the sylvian fissures on both sides. So you see the right MCA here, the left MCA here. So that's an excellent way to see what's going on on the entirety of the MCA quickly. Now here I've just pulled up some sagittal MIPS and what you're gonna see is it's very similar. The vessels have this flowing type appearance to them. You can see that multi-lobed aneurysm coming off of the carotid terminus here but this actually shows you the anterior cerebral arteries best you can see you can actually see a long segment of the anterior cerebral arteries as they wrap up around the anterior genome of the corpus callosum there so that's a really nice way to see that in a longitudinal plane there finally your coronal mips they give you a similar view uh, you get a nice view of the MCA and the long axis here. So you see it wrapping up into the cilium fissure. You also get an excellent view of the posterior circulation. You see the basilar artery here coming up as it bifurcates into the PCAs. You see the SCAs here. As you come posteriorly, you see the ICA and you see the vertebral confluence there. So you get a nice look at all of those pretty quickly. So in almost every case, I take a quick look at these just to see if there's something that I've missed. In addition to your MPRs and MIPS, it's possible you may have some 3D reformats. In this case, what you see is the same patient which uh, has that aneurysm which we saw previously along the carotid terminus. This is the bilobed aneurysm here. You can cone in on that and see it a little bit better. What you see here now is you have the carotid terminus here as it turns uh, towards the carotid bifurcation. This is the ACA and the MCA. And what you see here is you see that outpouching there, this bilobed aneurysm, you can rotate around it. VR reformats are not really great for searching for aneurysms, but they're excellent for further characterizing them. You can uh, make measurements of them. If you want to measure the neck of the aneurysm, uh, you can do that easily. So these are more in conjunction and you'll just use these uh, in addition to your additional reformats. All right, tip number four follow the blood. This is probably my favorite and most important tip here. Most of the time when you're doing CTAs in these patients, you're doing it because they came in with a headache or acute neurologic symptoms. They had a non-contrast head CT and they had subarachnoid hemorrhage. Use that blood to help guide your search because the area where the blood is densest is most likely to be the area where your hemorrhage is found. 
This is an example of another patient who came in and got a non-contrast head CT. Here, as we scroll up on this head CT, when you get to the left cilia and fissure, you're going to start to see some hyperdensity there. In the left cilia and fissure, it's going to track up into the remaining portions of the cilia and fissure. So you have subarachnoid hemorrhage asymmetrically on the left. This is suspicious for an aneurysm in this cilia and fissure along the course of this left MCA. This is now the patient's CT angiogram. You can see we're at the skull base here. We want to follow our normal pattern, so we don't want to be too thrown off by this. But in the interest of time, we're going to go straight to the area of interest. We're going to follow this left MCA out here. And what we're going to see as it goes around here, you're going to see an abnormal outpouching here. That's that aneurysm. And so there's an aneurysm arising from the M1 distal segment on the left, which is very central in that location of blood. So the blood was a nice clue of where to look for this aneurysm. Here we have a head CT of a young patient presenting with confusion. What you see almost immediately is anterior to the medulla, pons, and midbrain. You have a lot of blood products here in the basal cisterns, a lot of blood. Unlike one of the earlier cases we saw where there was anterior communicating artery aneurysm, what you see here is a lot more blood in the posterior distribution here. The center of the blood seems to be centered around the basilar tip here, which is a very useful piece of information. Here we have that patient's CT angiogram. We're going to start and we're going to quickly look at the posterior circulation here. You see the two vertebral arteries as they come up and form the basilar artery. You can almost make out blood products around the basilar artery displacing it there, but as you get to the basilar tip, what you're going to see is this bilobed outpouching coming off of the basilar tip here. And so that blood products led you right to the location of this basilar tip aneurysm. And to get further clarification of where that aneurysm is and what its configuration is, we can look at the coronal MIPS here. And as we scroll posteriorly, we see the MCAs and uh, carotid bifurcation there. But as we come posteriorly, here we can see the basilar artery. Here's the PCA on the right and the PCA on the left. And we see that bilobed outpouching coming off of the tip of the basilar artery there, really confirming that location is coming off the basilar tip there. So here we have another case of a patient coming in for a non-contrast head CT. As you come up, we're going to see some blood anterior to the pons here, some blood in the fourth ventricle. Then you see more blood along the right cavernous sinus in Meckel's cave here, and a little bit more blood in the sylvian fissure out here. So as we start looking at this CT angiogram, we're kind of thinking that it's going to be along the right side, maybe along the MCA or the carotid terminus. So we're going to follow this ICA up here. It's going to make its turn as we come around. First of all, we notice something that's not attached to anything there. And as we follow the carotid terminus up right here at the origin of the posterior communicating artery, there's a little downward directing outpouching that's got two little rounded uh, daughter parts here. So you have a little bilobed aneurysm there that's hemorrhaging into that location. So again, this is an example of how the location of the hemorrhage can guide you to the location of the aneurysm. So this slide is just a summary of those hemorrhage patterns. You can see as you go from left to right, you can see some of the different patterns that you might see. Here you have blood in the anterior portion of the interhemispheric fissure, the sylvian fissures. This is the anterior communicating kind of pattern. You have some blood out kind of far laterally in the sylvian fissure. This was due to an MCA aneurysm out there in the sylvian fissure. Here you have a little bit of central blood, a little bit in the sylvian fissure, so you're kind of thinking the hemorrhage might be anywhere in between. This was an aneurysm at the carotid terminus. And then here you have blood that's predominantly centered in a posterior location, and this is from a basilar tip aneurysm. So kind of burn these patterns into your head as to where you might see the locations of those aneurysms. Now, tip number five, recognize the mimics. There are going to be times when a patient comes in, they're going to have hemorrhage, which is not likely to be aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. If you can recognize those, you can improve your specificity by not finding a small outpouching or an infidibulum that you call an aneurysm. So what kind of mimics are you looking out for? You're really just thinking about what are the causes of hemorrhage that are not likely to be from an aneurysm. So the kind of red flags that you're looking for would be an atypical location an unusual history, and atypical patient demographics. So let's take a look at some of the most common mimics. One is hypertensive hemorrhage. Now, most of the time, these are going to be acute onset of symptoms. They're going to be predominantly parenchymal hemorrhage 
they're usually going to be older patients with hypertension, and they're going to be in these common locations, so basal ganglia, thalamus, pons, posterior fossa. If you see a parenchymal hemorrhage in those locations, it's not that likely to be from an aneurysm. Venous infarct is another big cause of hemorrhage that you may see. It can throw you off a little bit. It's often in an unusual distribution. So if you see a peripherally located hemorrhage, particularly at a cortical or subcortical junction, think about venous infarct and hemorrhage from a venous infarct. These patients tend to be younger. They tend to be women more than men. They may be patients with coagulation disorders or on medications that increase their risk of clotting, such as uh, hormonal contraception. Now, in this case, you see a peripheral hemorrhage. You see on a CT venogram, there's extensive thrombus in the superior sagittal sinus here. And this hemorrhage is essentially from overpressure in the associated veins. Next, tumor. If you see a lot of mass effect and there's mass effect out of proportion to the extent of hemorrhage, think about whether there could be an underlying mass. In this patient, you see a non-contrast CT, a little bit of hemorrhage here along the anterior cingulate. But if you look a little closer, it appears to be there's a bigger region of expansion here that crosses the midline. When this patient got an MR on flare, they've got expansion of the cingulate crossing the corpus callosum here. They also have an abnormal area of enhancement there in the corpus callosum. This turned out to be a high-grade glioma. So anytime you see mass effect associated with it, think about whether it could be a MET, could it be a high-grade tumor, could it be a cavernous malformation. Again, these tend to be unusual locations for classic subarachnoid hemorrhage. They tend to have mass-like features, and these patients are frequently going to require an MRI to figure out what the cause of their underlying hemorrhage may be. Finally, this is an isolated cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage called benign perimesencephalic subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's a subarachnoid hemorrhage of unknown etiology, which is predominantly centered in the basal cisterns and anterior to the pons here, the perimesencephalic cisterns. These patients will have negative workup on CT angiogram, MR angiogram, because there's not an underlying arterial cause. These are thought to be from venous, uh, venous tears. Finally, just in summary, I've given you five steps to get better at finding aneurysms. Just to review them, have a standard search pattern. Go through your search pattern the same every time. Know your common aneurysm locations. Those are the anterior communicating artery, the carotid terminus, the MCA, then the posterior fossa. Use your e-formats that you have to your advantage to clarify any findings you might see, maybe to increase your sensitivity in certain areas. Number four, and my favorite again, follow the blood. When you see a pattern of blood, look in the area where the hemorrhage is likely to be. And finally, recognize the mimics. Don't be confused by a mimic that causes intracranial hemorrhage. If it's an unusual demographic or distribution, uh, don't be concerned when you don't see an aneurysm. So you don't have to overcall aneurysms in those cases. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Hopefully these five quick tips are going to make you better at interpreting CTA of the head and finding aneurysm. If you're interested in more, you can learn more at our website, learnneuroradiology.com. Be sure to check out the full course on vascular imaging. You've got a full description of the search pattern there. A lot of other interesting videos you can check out. If you like the channel, be sure to like uh, the video and subscribe to the channel so you get notifications. Thanks to everyone for tuning in, and uh, it was great to seeing you. Until next time.